you all for for joining us on this uh, lovely weather day. I hope it's as nice where you guys are as it is in Carlisle today. Um, thanks for coming to our, I think this is our third cooking class of the semester. Um, thanks to those who came to our previous ones. Um, but uh, today we will be learning all about bread um, from Professor Fonkuchen from the German department. And um, Professor Fonkuchen uh, was an avid volunteer at the farm uh, at the end of the summer and the like getting up and through the fall um and she i think there's like one person in the audience who actually has her um sourdough starter um who like she uh she's able to there's a lot of bread baking happening at the farm thanks to um <laughs> professor von Kuchen. so uh we thought it would be a great way to share it with uh, everyone else so um I, I've tried the bread and it's delicious. So I hope you guys learn how to make um, this especially delicious bread too. So I, with that, I'll pass it over to, to um, uh, I keep wanting to call you Auntie. I'm sorry. That's auntie. perfectly <laughs> fine. You know, I, I'm, in the announcement, I thought it should be somewhat official, but otherwise I'm Auntie. That's cool. completely fine. Passing it over to Auntie. Even and, though, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, so. nothing. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even though what I was about to say, my last name is actually especially fitting for a baking class, as some know, because either they speak German or I've told them before, because it means pancake in German. So I'm predestined to teach some baking, I guess, or something like that. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Maddie, for organizing it. Uh, I have to say the days at the farm were muddy and dirty, but a lot of fun. And uh, I really, really enjoyed getting out there and uh, talking to all the people for which there's a lot of time while you're weeding or harvesting something. And um, yeah, so I was happy to collaborate in, in this endeavor here with the, with the teaching a course. Um, so the first idea had been to call it a sourdough class, but then for all sorts of reasons, I decided against that, partly because sourdough has become such a, I don't even know what to call it during the pandemic, a meme or a, 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 some, something strange. And also because I didn't want uh, anyone to think it's some very elaborate kind of baking that is uh, planned here. And instead uh, I wanted to, teach or especially talk about teaching a course that um, uh, that that is really uh, taking away some sort of hesitation for people to to bake bread because it's in the end really simple and I uh, I myself didn't really start baking or cooking until I was in college and uh, I did very simple things for a long part of my life and I really only started bread baking when I came to Carlisle. And uh, the reason is uh, that I used to live in big cities. I mean, first in Germany, but then also in other big cities where there were always fancy bakeries of all sorts and uh, I could get my bread fixed. And, but when I came to Carlisle here a bit over a decade ago, there wasn't really much in terms of getting really good bread, the kind of bread that I knew from Germany. And uh, what I do did also realize in that situation was that because many students especially or other people have asked me over the years, oh, don't you miss German food? And I always thought, mm, well, I mean, not really that much. I mean, I like the food that my mom cooks, but it's kind of a little bit heavy and uh, I, I wouldn't always want to eat it and when I cook myself or go out to eat I'm not actually seeking out German food but uh, what I did realize is I do really miss German bread and the Germans they take that bread very seriously and uh, maybe I oh can I do screen share sure let me let me see here because I had uh, oh gosh no I don't even know what I'm doing here okay let me try if that works 
Ugh. Probably that I should have tried before. Okay. Uh, sorry about this. That was something that I didn't remember. Okay. So zoom. Oh no. Okay. All right. So this doesn't work because uh, I have to reboot. The, okay. All right. So I won't show you pictures, but uh, I can I can describe the pictures to you, and will tell you that in Germany, in every bakery, you have like at least a hundred different kinds of like from rolls of all sorts and flavors to bread of like from like completely white bread to very dark uh, Schwarzbrot, what they call black bread actually, and everything in between. And also, I mean, I did like a minimal amount of, of research and looked it up and uh, it seems that bread exists in almost any culture in the world uh, in, in different forms. I mean, flat bread, tortilla and, uh, you know, whatever uh, you've seen. But the Germans are generally described as the center of the bread world or something because uh, yeah there are really like so many different kinds and um, uh, and and every German eats a lot of bread also. Um, so that's I guess the point where I realized that I do miss some German food and that I am more German than I sometimes want to believe myself and uh, the the German word for dinner, actually, I mean, for the evening meal is Abendbrot, which literally means evening bread. And traditionally also, that's what you eat in the evening, bread with some cheese or sausage or something on, on top. And uh, so it's, it's like a very important part of culture. And one aspect of bread is also, uh, I don't, I mean, that is not my own invention that I've read that somewhere is that bread is a word that is at the same time extremely easy and almost impossible to translate because uh, bread and uh, brot in German, pane, pain, whatever language you speak, uh, I mean, it's always bread, but what people think of and imagine when they say it is so different. I mean, like the French think of a baguette, uh, the Germans of their black bread or something. So uh, it's it's sort of, it's an interesting cultural object uh, in that regard also. Um, so, okay, so now I can't show you the breads, uh, but the, the, the most uh, popular bread in Germany is called a Mischbrot, which literally means a mixed bread. Uh, and that is uh, about half, and I mean, it's it's not completely uh, 100%, um, uh, but about half uh, wheat flour and about half rye flour. And that's the kind of bread that uh, is eaten the most in Germany. And that's also the, the bread that I uh, uh, decided to make. I mean, that's the recipe I, I put on the Google Doc. I would still recommend to everyone who has never baked bread before, that you started at first with this no need bread, which is not particularly German at all, but it is so simple and so good. I mean, that's the part that I couldn't believe because when I was, arrived in Carlisle and there wasn't really much happening, I, I was yeah, sort of not doing anything about it until a colleague of mine who was only, he was a visitor for a year. Uh, I invited him over for dinner back in the days when you could still do that. And uh, he brought one of the no need breads that he had made. And I was completely stunned because it was so good. I couldn't believe that a bread could be so simple and so good. And this no need bread, uh, I linked it on, on the Google doc, I think, yeah. Um, it really just takes time and nothing else. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, what I didn't like so much about it ultimately was that it didn't have uh, rye flour in it because it's it's very difficult to get rye flour to rise if you don't need it. And also the um, the sort of sour flavor of, of sourdough that I really enjoy. 
but so I started from that no need bread and then just uh, started to change things around a little bit. And it was sort of an experimental journey of adding a little bit of this and then it didn't work and then doing it a bit differently. And over the years, I've, I've changed things around more. And actually until probably about a year ago, I would still always use the tiny bit of, uh, of uh, baker's yeast. I mean, that's what's in there here, like this, what you maybe use for a cake or for something else, um, which is like a quarter teaspoon. And it, uh, the, the yeast really is uh, in principle, very similar to the sourdough starter. It's just stronger. It's it's somehow, I mean, in the sourdough starter that I have here for you, I don't know, maybe I'll try to hold it close. Can you see all the little bubbles in there? And uh, the sourdough starter is natural yeasts. And uh, the the this one here is basically yeast on steroids, one could say. I mean, it's like, uh, got a lot more power, but it also doesn't have the complexity of the, of the sourdough starter in terms of flavor. Uh, the added ingredients in the, in the sourdough starter uh, is also uh, lactobacilli, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, that those are little tiny uh, bacteria, I guess, in the end that produce uh, 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 lactic acid. And uh, that is uh, that does a lot for the for the sour flavor actually, and so in that sense, this is a this is a living being here, my little pet. For a long time, it was my only pet, and uh, um, so you you have to take care of it. But at the same time, it's not extremely fuzzy, and and uh, it also survives a whole time of neglect because I've heard of people who, who when it didn't look so good anymore and then they just threw it out uh, which is not necessary because you can usually um, just scrape off the top that may look black or moldy or something like that and then underneath there's still a little bit of, of the good stuff and once you you feed that with uh, more flour and water then it, it will come back to life usually. I mean, I've had mine in the fridge for months at the time and um, it still came back. I do have to say, I mean, so there are many ways to get sourdough starter. One of them would be, I mean, contact me even after this class and I can share some of this. And uh, there are uh, on the internet, uh, all, I mean, I think you can buy them all over the place or even, or what I did in Germany, they, sent, they, they sell these little packages in the drugstore or supermarket or so uh, that uh, are meant to be used just for one bread. I mean, it's, it's basically you take this and flour and everything and make your bread and bake it. And I brought, oops, I brought one uh, along and uh, and just started feeding it instead of using it in, in a bread and that multiplied it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that, that was this one, like, but a long time ago, many years, and it somehow survived. The one thing I noticed is that uh, the flour makes quite a difference in terms of what kind of flour to use uh, for, the, for the sourdough starter. And in my experience, uh, uh, rye flour. So the starter is exclusively rye flour, and that uh, somehow uh, has has better success for me. I guess I I have um, sort of uh, uh, grown little kits of that, or however you want to call it, like baby sourdoughs, and I've tried it with different flour, and and I find it with wheat, it's not as good, and. Um, the best and easiest way to really keep it going and keep it alive uh, for me has been uh, like whole whole wheat rye flour, I guess I, you could call it. I mean, I actually have to do a shout out to a um, mill that I discovered. 
Oh, so the one thing I, I was about to say is uh, uh, maybe that first that until about a year ago, I used uh, the sourdough mainly as a flavoring for my bread and still had the yeast in it for the rising because it's not totally trivial to, to get things to um, to get things to to uh, to rise with just the sourdough starter but um when the pandemic hit and yeast was suddenly sold out everywhere i got more into trying to really just work with the sourdough starter that i had and the other thing that was also sold out was flour in many stores and uh then i discovered uh, a little I mean, semi-local, it's in Pennsylvania, a mill. I have to give them a little, uh, here they are called Castle Valley Mill. And uh, I, I can put it on the Google Doc or send it if you're interested. Because uh, so it's, it, it's in terms of farm sustainability, local food and all of that. Uh, they, they are so amazing and it's not even that expensive, I think. I don't know. I, I buy 10 pound bags and they're, I mean, definitely under $20, which I think for, for flour that good is, is really not, not expensive. They even ship free if you order for 30 bag, bucks total. And that flour, I had no idea. I mean, I had baked with supermarket flour before for, yeah, until then. But this is just, it's so fresh and it makes a world of difference in terms of uh, flavor and working with it. And also, especially uh, for to feed the sourdough starter uh, because yeah, somehow it, it just gets things moving a lot better. At the same time, maybe one more thing about the sourdough starter. Um, and that is also why at some point these yeasts were developed and invented. Uh, it is a bit temperamental in terms of uh, working better under some circumstances than others. Um, uh, for instance, I mean, uh, the temperature plays a role. I mean, that you can use that uh, to, to some degree by um, putting it in the fridge when you don't want to use it because that slows everything down. At the same time, sometimes in the winter, it's, it's harder to get it going Whereas in the summer, it's much, uh, I mean, it, it's, it rises much faster. Uh, and the same also with humidity. Uh, I mean, because yeast is, as I also learned, I don't know if anyone of you has seen that, that documentary, uh, Fantastic Fungi, I think it's somewhere on Amazon or so. And so yeast is in the end, a kind of fungus. And uh, you all know under what conditions mold and, and such fungi grow and so when it's warm and humid uh, they they grow much better and the same is true for the sourdough i mean it's in some ways even do for yeast when you when you bake with yeast but yeast has uh, more powers to overcome adverse conditions i guess um okay so far, I mean, if anyone has questions, we can also take a little break. I don't know. I've been trying to explain things and talk about stuff, but if someone wants to know something. No? Okay. Um, okay, so one little more thing of, of uh, sort of yeast and uh, sourdough science is that, uh, so these little, uh, fungi, what they do in the in the dough or like when it's rising before it's baked, of course, like once you bake it all, then you kill them off. And um, but uh, the way they get bread to rise is that they actually digest the sugars and and every flour. I mean, carbohydrates is sort of a kind of sugar in that sense. Uh, so they digest it and uh, produce on the one hand alcohol and on the other hand uh, carbon carbon dioxide yes carbon dioxide that's what it is and so yeast is also used for beer production for instance and for actually other alcohol uh, like wine and, and champagne production and uh, but what uh, but that i think the alcohol production takes a little bit longer and different uh, uh, circumstances 
But uh, in the flower, what comes uh, to our help here is the carbon dioxide uh, production. So it, it basically creates these bubbles in the dough. And uh, those are the ones that create the rise and uh, um, yeah, and, and make the, the little holes in the, in the uh, bread. Let me see, how do we go from here? I took some notes, but I also spoke about a lot of these things already. Okay, so maybe I'll get to uh, kind of summarizing the recipe that I, that I uh, had sent to Maddie that's on the Google Doc. And since it takes such a long time uh, for, between these steps, uh, I will have to talk about some and I will show you uh, another. And so I start with this sourdough starter. And I mean, this one I already sort of fed. Usually when I keep it in the fridge, I don't fill the jar quite that high, um, uh, just a little bit. And then when I take it out to use, so you should take it out of the fridge about, I mean, yeah, it, it should come to room temperature. And then uh, you add about the same amount of flour and water to it. Uh, and mix it well, and and then it will uh, the the little uh, living beings will multiply and it will uh, uh, grow and get all bubbly. I mean that's why I like to use a glass because you can really see the little bubbles in here. And in the recipe that I'm using right now um, these days, uh, and I'm sort of I'm not a very good recipe follower. That's why things change around uh, at times but the one that I posted for you, I basically, the, the next step is to, to multiply the starter even more so that I create a big batch of, of, yeah, what is sort of the starter. So I take about a cup of this and uh, two cups of rye flour and uh, two cups of water. Uh, it's good to use uh, filtered water or somehow, I mean, because the, uh, the uh, chlorine and such things are not necessarily life supporting. So, so everything of that that you can uh, reduce uh, will, will make it easier to be successful. I mean, at the same time, it's, I mean, it, it is uh, flexible. Uh, okay, so, so then but these like two and two cups. And so you end up with five cups of sourdough starter uh, more or less in, in your bowl. And that's what I did. Uh, uh, I actually started it earlier today. And I'll show you where I am right now. So I'm using a, just the mixing bowl from the mixer to make it easy. Um, I do have, uh, uh, I mean, you can use just general uh, plastic covering. It's, it's good to have it relatively airtight so that it doesn't dry out over the long waiting time. And uh, the, um, so the, 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 uh, so that was one, that was the first step and that you leave, I mean, the, the easiest way is really to do it overnight, to just let it sit overnight and then it gets all bubbly again, kind of like this that you can see here. And uh, once it's at that point, and it's, it's fairly liquid also at this point. And once you have it there uh, and, and it is bubbly, I add two cups of wheat flour now because uh, it's like with only rye, the bread will never rise. Rye flour is a lot heavier and uh, and you really need to add some wheat in it. I mean, I've seen for sale in places a uh, bread that claims to be 100% rye, but I'm not sure. I mean, I guess professional bakers have other means to, to get things going, but I, I have never been able to, to get 100% rye bread. Even, even if, you, if you do more than 50%, it gets, uh, uh, yeah, it gets dicey. And but with, with about 50%, uh, it, it, uh, I've, I've gotten it to work. And um, so what I also did then about two hours ago, I put that whole thing in the, 
kitchen aid with the leading hook and had it uh, with the with the additional uh, two cups of wheat flour had had it um, uh, needed it for like 15 20 minutes you can do it by hand the one thing that um makes it a little more difficult to do by hand is that it's actually better for this kind of bread when the dough is not too dry um so in that sense i mean i, I also because i'm lazy i guess i i like the the kitchen aid uh, to to just let it going for a while because right now it's still let me see can you add to here yeah it's still relatively liquid but uh, what happens with the kneading, and that's really uh, something uh, you, you would notice, I mean, no matter how you knead it, um, is that, that um, the dough begins to stick to itself more. I mean, so because it is sort of a bit of a sticky dough, the way it's our dough or yeast dough is, but, but with the kneading, and I guess if you use only wheat flour, that happens just by letting it sit. I mean, that's the trick with the no knead bread that like just letting it sit, it somehow develops the gluten. I can't scientifically explain to you how that happens, but uh, the, the gluten results in this, in this uh, behavior that the dough sticks to itself. Um, and now I'm at the point, now I'll see, now I wish I had the camera that Nidja had with the over the top, but I'll, I'll do it like this and because, uh, uh, let me see, I'll, get, I'll, I'll show you as much of it as I can. So this is the basket that I'm using, the rising basket, which I mean, I only got relatively recently. Uh, you can perfectly do it without it either by putting it in a bowl. A bowl is a little tricky, maybe because it doesn't breathe. It might be too, too um, constricting. But for a long time, I just put uh, the the whatever ball of bread just into a, a tea towel, like a how do you call it? Yeah, tea towel. Is that what you call it? I think so. And so nowadays I put this in the bowl, kind of like that, and uh, leave a little bit out here because it's always good to cover it while it rises again. Okay, now let me see, I will try to do this here. Yeah, maybe that, that will show you something on my dirty corners. Um, Okay, so, and, and what is important with the towel is that you flour it well. And uh, for that, uh, I mean, in the, in the Noni bread recipe, I think they use even uh, like corn grits or, or something like that. But I mean, I, I have found that regular flour works quite well. You just have to distribute it as, as good as you can. So I'm putting this here, like, I mean, it's, it's not a problem and it's a little too much because then it will just fall out once you bake it. And um, if it's too little, then the dough will stick to this, to the towel. Let me put this here. And now, and this is relatively wet here because I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, ways you can do that. I, I'm just using sort of the, the easy way again, because I don't like to flower a whole surface and, and then have to deal with that. So I'm basically just dumping this dough into, and I'm, I'm kind of spooning it here a little bit with the spatula, but I'm basically just dumping it into this um, rising basket. I think, so if you, if you don't have a basket, I guess, I mean, a bowl would work. If you, if you do it just on the towel, you have to leave the dough a little bit um, drier so that it's not quite as runny because otherwise it will run away from you. Let me see. So, I mean, it happens to me all the time then that it does stick to the towel anyway but that is also not 
the end of the world and can be remedied. Okay, so I'm trying to get as much of it out as I can. And here it's already noticeable that it's somehow the dough uh, sticks really more to itself than to, to other places and uh, even your fingers. I mean, so it's relatively manageable. Um, I am now adding a little flower here on the top also because it's supposed to rise and yeah, maybe it's not just to give it a little more on the edges to not have too much sticking to the to the towel. Okay, I think that is about it. So I'll cover this. Excuse me, Professor. This is tea. yes. Is, um, now that is after you kneaded it. It was still that liquidy. Yes. After you put it in your mixer. Yes, it's still oh. relatively. I mean, and admittedly, I'm I'm not a very good recipe follower. So that and and also I think it depends on the weather and on all sorts of things. Sometimes it is more liquidy. Sometimes a little less. It's for baking, it's actually good when it's it's relatively liquidy because that makes it overall lighter and then it rises more. Like when it's when it's heavier uh, uh, or drier, then the, the uh, little sourdough bacteria have a harder time raising things up. And oh, thank in that you. sense, yeah, that's, yeah, that kind of works. So, and then in this uh, state, right, I'll show you. So I cover it a bit and I often even put the, the plastic here on it again because uh, you, you really don't want it to dry out too much. But uh, at this point, it's, it's actually mostly okay. Um, and now it needs to sit again for another two hours, I would say at least. Uh, uh, so it's it's really, I mean, I don't know if you do it on a weekend or somehow you kind of have to plan a little bit uh, ahead, but at the same time, if you, it, it's usually not a problem uh, to let it rise a little bit longer than, uh, than the originally planned time. To let it rise shorter is uh, more uh, problematic because then it often doesn't rise enough. Uh, but to let it sit, I mean, I've even done it that uh, I, I had it all going and everything and then it was already so late and I wasn't willing to stay up even longer. And I just put the whole thing in the fridge and then took it out the next morning and uh, continued where I, where I had stopped before. So it's really, um, I mean, it, it, you have to experiment a little bit and, and be open to a certain degree of failure. I mean, I've baked bread that uh, ended up being breadcrumbs right away because it had gotten so heavy and dense that nobody really wanted to eat it, but the flavor was still good. And um, uh, yeah, so in, in that sense, it's, it's, I mean, that's the worst that can happen to you that it doesn't, doesn't rise. And um, one thing, wait, I'll just quickly rinse my hands a little. Okay, uh, the one thing that really made for me all the difference also uh, with bread baking is the so-called Dutch oven which I use this one, which is relatively big. I, I did realize, and because I tried it uh, a little while ago, if you really do the, like the no need bread, the original recipe, which only uses three cups of flour, I think it's a relatively small bread. And I, I always, even when I first did that, I always found it, it's kind of a lot of work for a very little loaf of bread in the end. So I've always tried to, to make some more uh, even then, uh, because with, with that, if in, in this kind of part here, uh, it, it just gets really flat because since the dough is relatively liquidy, I mean, it, it spreads out throughout the whole pot and um, then it just can't rise as, as high anymore. And so this one, uh, after the, the, um, the, uh, the 
bread in the basket there has risen for about an hour and a half or something like that. Uh, you put this this um, Dutch oven in your oven. Uh, it basically creates a little oven within the big oven. And uh, the effect of it is uh, on the one hand uh, that the bread can't just spread out all over the uh, um, sheet or wherever you, else you would bake it. And at the same time, uh, to cover it immediately in this hot uh, uh, thing, I mean, you, you really have to be careful because it, it gets very hot. The oven is supposed to be at at least 450. Some people say even higher. And um, uh, it's, once the, the dough uh, gets dumped into it, and that's what, what I'll do in two hours with the, with the dough that I just showed you, uh, it, it immediately forms a crust also. And that makes a, a really nice crust, which, which at the, I mean, some people don't like crust, but I, I actually do. And it, it keeps a lot of the moisture in the bread. So it doesn't, it doesn't dry out. I mean, it's um, kind of a moisture full or yeah, a moist bread. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it's really, it's, it's waiting, 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 and then, uh, doing a few steps in between. But as I said, I mean, if, if it doesn't fit your schedule, uh, just putting it in the Brit in, in the fridge for a while uh, can can help you out and uh, uh, tide you over and then you just continue where you left it off. Except that you always need a little bit of time to get it back to room temperature, at least. Um, yeah, so this oven goes in the oven for half an hour when it's really hot uh, you carefully take it out dump the dough in it cover it up immediately i mean the cover is also in the oven and then you bake it for half an hour with the cover and then you take the cover off and bake it for about 20 minutes uh, 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 without the cover and i have to say i've never had any problems with that and it was very funny, actually, once I brought the bread somewhere to, to a party or so, and the host was trying to be funny and said something about, oh, the bread isn't baked through. And I just looked at him and was like, no, that's not possible because it has never happened. I mean, because if we, somehow, I mean, in this Dutch oven and, and with this heat, I think it's, it's almost impossible. And if you keep the time somehow. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to, to not bake through. I don't know what, what you would have to do. And because I did want to show you a result, even though we don't have the time to wait for it right now, I actually baked the bread yesterday. And so when you open the pot, then you can see this here. And this is the bread. And so when it's done, I mean, when the time is over and everything is very hot and you need uh, uh, mittens or whatever uh, pot holders you have, then you can dump it out onto a surface and then it looks like this. Oops, oh, okay, so now I can move this up again. Okay, here. So this is the finished bread which uh, yeah, looks not too bad. And in uh, this case, I'll also show you how it looks when it's cut open. Um, let me just get a board and my bread knife. Sometimes, I mean, some people don't like it when there's so much flour on it. You can just uh, shake it a bit and then it will come off. And I'll just cut it through the middle right now to... So this is how the bread looks on the inside. Let me see. Let me see it all. And so it's, it's still a relatively denser bread. I mean, uh, if, if you want sort of big holes in it and, and uh, which is sort of 
uh, yeah, then then I think you you would have to use a little bit of yeast because the sourdough, at least in my experience, in my home baking experience, the sourdough will never create uh, like bigger holes. But I actually really enjoy it like that. That's the kind of German mischbrot, the mixed bread <laughs> that I remember from my childhood days that you can buy all over the place. And uh, in this case, I even added some uh, oh gosh, what's it called? Caraway seeds, caraway seeds. Uh, because I mean, it has a, a, a part of rye, you can't really see it. It's somewhere, I can smell it. And uh, that's the uh, rye with caraway seeds because I, I remembered that I like that also. So, and you can do all sorts of things with this, with this bread. Um, I did even uh, buy like a like an attachment for my uh, uh, like the the uh, kitchen aid that grinds uh, flour from the kernels and all of that. I haven't really used it all that much, uh, but uh, uh, I mean you can make relatively coarse. Uh, yeah, it's not even quite flour, but uh, uh, that you can add to the bread and um, uh, make it even more German. And uh, yeah, any any sorts of other thing. I guess you could yeah you could add spices and uh, rosemary. I guess that's what uh, Joyce was talking about earlier. And yeah, there's no end to experimentation. And I think that's the end of what I wanted to share with you today. And. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm open to any sort of questions and comments and uh, if someone wants to um, say something. Oops. Yeah? Um, I just wondered on the no need, you said you can put a pinch of yeast. Does that, how, how much does that do? Cause it, you don't, do you let it sit then for a while or do you just? I I mean, the no knead bread actually that only works with yeast. That doesn't. I mean, the original no knead re uh, recipe that has um, uh, no sourdough in it, it. It uses a quarter of a teaspoon of of this kind of like the active dry yeast, and uh, it really uh, uh, multiplies basically over time. I think that's what 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 the what the uh, what happens. I mean, if you if you want to bake sort of a, a quick bread or, or, or quicker bread or like, I don't know, like a hala kind of thing, then you use a lot of the yeast and it takes about maybe an hour to rise and gets nice and big. And with that very small amount of yeast, you don't get the, the yeast flavor. So it doesn't taste like, uh, because I guess, or like the, the okay. breads that I know that, that are, are rising more quickly, they, they do taste like yeast, which I also like, but uh, it's just different. And with, the, with the, just the pinch, I mean, I can't explain to you the whole science behind it, but uh, it's really the, the long time that, uh, that uh, basically multiplies the, the little bit of yeast and, and makes it rise. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so if we don't have this uh, basket, uh, you yeah. went over this briefly, but we just sort of stick this uh, towel in a normal bowl. Yeah. And cover I, I mean, with flour. Exactly. I mean, uh, uh, it, I would maybe even use two towels or something because I guess the one thing that I'm uh, uh, considering is that it may get too moist when it's just in in that bowl with one towel and then it even more will stick to the towel so mm. i guess the advantage of the basket is that it's it's a little bit of uh uh yeah it's not quite a quite a a, a straight surface uh, or, or a smooth surface and and so it, it allows for like a minimal amount of air circulation so, but I mean, I don't even, I don't, I'm not sure actually how I, I think, yeah, no, but I, what if I we, think. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What if we had like a, this might sound silly, like a colander or a strainer or something like that. that yeah, that's actually allow... great. Yeah, that sounds okay. great. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
something that allows for a little bit of air, I think would be better than, than a completely closed bowl. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is another um, question in the chat that I also have yes. um, about if you ever put stuff like nuts or berries in any of your breads, I don't know how that would taste with the sourdough necessarily, but if you've ever done that and what's your favorite? You know, I, I admit that I haven't really done it because on some level I'm maybe a purist, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I mean, I, I have bought breads like that at the, at the farmer's market here in town. And I mean, one problem is that one member of my household doesn't eat fruit, so fruits are out <laughs> already, but um, the uh, you could put nuts. I mean, it's sort of, I guess it's a bit of experimenting in terms of uh, the rising times. I guess everything additional that you put in the dough makes it sort of heavier and harder to rise. And I would probably, and I mean, I even do that nowadays sometimes, like when I'm worried that it may not rise enough, but just the sourdough, I just add like a, a little pinch of I mean, even less than a quarter teaspoon, like an eighth of a teaspoon or something of yeast to it, just to give it a little extra push or so. And uh, probably if, if I would put more things in it, I, I would try to do that just to not end up with the heavy flat. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I anyone who's more experimental can try it out and. <laughs> From what I've seen of the Great British Bake Off, it's normally a risky move to include fruit and nuts in your bread. So, your your, your advice. I can that. imagine. <laughs> yeah, um, and probably. I mean, because fruit bring in more moisture, then you should probably make the entire dough a little drier. And yeah, so I mean, what what I would always say is try it out, and if it doesn't work, then try it again or do it differently next time. Yeah, <laughs> at least you won't be doing it on national television like everyone else on the great. Exactly, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no ambition. <laughs> I think there is another question about like um, the end of the, the baking. Um, when you, uh, uh, when your uh, loaf is done, do you have to wait for it to cool before turning it out of the Dutch oven or can you just like immediately pop oh, it You can out? immediately pop it out. I mean, I would probably even do it because otherwise, uh, since the Dutch oven is so hot, you run the danger that it would get burned. And uh, I, I usually pop it out right away and uh, let it cool on a, on a rack or somewhere where I mean, if you if yeah, I wouldn't put it on a on a solid surface because then uh, the moisture makes it kind of soggy. So to to let it cool on a like either on a baking rack or on like sometimes I just tilt it against something to have a little bit of air circulation around it. There's another question um, okay. about how how often do you bake bread? Good question. I mean, uh, I probably bake about once a week, but it also, it really depends. Uh, I mean, a bread of like that lasts about a week, maybe. But I guess nowadays with the farmer's market and good bread offerings there, when I'm busy and, and when whatever we have an appetite for something else, then we also buy it there. The one thing I can say is that the sourdough it gets better and better the more you bake. I mean, because if it's kept active and used and then fed again, then that's really the best you can do for the sourdough. And uh, when you keep it in the fridge for a while, it's, it's sort of a bit more labor to make it live and bubbly again, but yeah. I'm not seeing too many, any, I don't think I saw any other questions in the chat. Oh, can you repeat the name of the um, bakery? Uh, the, oh, the, the, yeah. Oh. It's called Castle Valley. Wait, let me see if, if this, oops, okay. Wait, is this visible here? Oh, hold on. 
not really yeah, or i can castle yeah. Valley. yeah castle valley and i mean i can i can send the link to you and you can add it to the google doc because Great. i mean they they seem to be a really small business kind of thing they i i saw at some point that they have a that they added a blog to their website where they talked about how they used to just uh, uh, deliver to restaurants and and places like that but then when the pandemic came they immediately changed their production and are now selling sort of to regular customers and they're really I mean they they ship super quickly and the flower is just amazing so I'm happy to advertise them <laughs> I have a question um, yeah. in the Google Doc you said that your daughter um, prefers white bread so how often does she bake and 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 did she, did she get the bug from you you know, she does almost all the baking in our house, and I, I'm not sure if she's actually out right now. Otherwise, I would pull her here, and uh, but she had better plans. Um, so she she does basically all the baking in our house except bread, and uh, she has experimented with all kinds of things. She also made. I mean, she 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 always tells me that I'm just not doing it right and that I should do the sourdough differently and, and, and have to whatever procedure and somehow she has decided at this point that she doesn't like my bread but she liked it before and maybe she'll come back to it <laughs> but she I mean she does a lot of baking but actually not not that much bread I mean she's tried it but but somehow she's more interested in other baking adventures Same. Well yeah um cool do you have any like last uh words of wisdom for those who will venture to make their own bread sourdough or otherwise after this and then we'll wrap it up i don't know what wisdom i mean the the first is if anyone even in the near future or or far future i'll, I'll have to see if i'm around uh, uh once a sourdough starter i'm happy to share and I can do contact free pickup on the porch or something. I'm in Carla, very close to the college. And uh, otherwise, I would say, yeah, just don't be discouraged by potential failure. It, uh, it either works or it doesn't. And if it didn't the first time around, then just try it again. And at some point it will happen. I promise. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for uh, informing us and giving us such a very detailed and informative uh, seminar on how to make bread and sourdough bread specifically. So thank you. And I guess one thing I should say, like once things change again and there will be farm parties and stuff like that again, I will bring some of the bread for people to taste. Or I mean, like office parties. I, I have brought it to office parties and it uh, was eaten happily. So I'm, I'm also happy to share in that way. Great, well, thank you all for coming. I hope you all get the chance to try Antia's bread one day. Um, and uh, I hope you guys tune into our next cooking class, which will be advertised soon, tomorrow, if not later, um, which will be a, uh, how to make uh, arepas with Professor Pass from the Spanish department. Mm -hmm. So make sure you, you tune into that one. And thank you for coming. Everyone have a great Good night. Far. Good luck with your uh, breads.